Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Susan, for that lead in. And it, it's good to be here in Wisconsin. I, I, I had a lot of trips to Wisconsin uh, when I was working with the Shifting Gears Initiative a few years ago, uh, late 2000s, early uh, uh, late 2000s, I guess, is when it was. So it's good to be good to be back. So the Georgetown Center, where where I work, was created about 10 years ago, uh, almost exactly 10 years ago, and our research has been very consistent, has kept has had a consistent focus over the years on the changing economy and what that means for, for education systems, for higher education in particular. Our research has shown the, that we're, that we're the last, few gener last few decades, we've seen a transition from an industrial economy, a changing industrial economy, to an economy that's much more service-based and that favors, that has favored educated workers. As we see it, post-secondary education and training, it's no longer a nice to have for most people. It's actually become quite important to secure good jobs in the economy. So this chart is one of, uh, one of our go-to charts, and it shows, uh, it shows the importance of education in the labor market over time. And as you can see, back in the 1970s, all the way on the, on the left side, Three out of four jobs, or just about that, went to high school educated workers. And in fact, a fair number went to students who didn't finish high school, who were able to get decent jobs right out of 10th grade or so. Well, that's changed. By, by 2010, that number was down to about two out of five jobs going to high school educated workers, and a much larger share, the blue shading there, going to workers with some level some level of post-secondary education and training. That's some college, no credential, associate degree, bachelor's degree, or beyond. So, so that quite a bit of a change in, in just, a few, just a few generations. And also, starting in the 1980s, we saw a rising wage premium going to college-educated workers across the country. That is, we saw a much sharper difference in the earnings of college-educated workers compared to high school educated workers. That really started to take off in the 1980s and 90s. And, and there still is. There is still quite a difference. And what is this a sign of? It's a sign that you know, even, as we, even as the college educated population has grown over time, uh, the wage premium, premium has been there. And it's a sign of the demand for educated workers in the economy by business, by business and industry. Now, uh, the Georgetown Center's recognize, one of the things we're recognized for is our set of job projections, where we look at where the, where the jobs are going and education requirements associated with those jobs. And we're actually in the middle of updating them right now. You'll be, I guess maybe you'll be happy to know, but, um, and, and we're going to be taking them out to 2027, which is kind of interesting given your, given your goal. We're, we're unfortunately right in between our last set of projections and our current set of projections, so, uh, which are going to be coming out later this year or possibly early 2019, hopefully later this year. But the point is our last set of projections is still a reasonable marker. It's still a good indicator of where, uh, where we're headed. And this chart, which, which does come out of our report on the recovery, uh, our last major report, or last major set of projections shows Wisconsin in relation to, to other states and the national average. And what we found then, and it's, and it's likely to be at that or, or even above that in the next round of projections, Wisconsin's just a few points away from the national average. About 62% of the job openings uh, that going forward are likely to require, again, some form of post-secondary education, whether it's some college, no credential, associate degree, BA, or beyond. And so what are job openings? Just a quick point on job openings, is that's an important point. It's job openings are really the job opportunities that become available over time as, first of all, as new jobs are created because of economic growth. You know, right now we're in an expansion and, and uh, we're, 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 there, are there are jobs due to growth, but also replacement jobs. So when jobs, job openings become available when an older worker goes into retirement and essentially yields a slot, so to speak, to, to a, usually a younger worker or perhaps another older worker. But, 
and or if somebody leaves an occupation. So there's so job openings are really a combination of the new job openings due to growth and the replacement jobs. And so, so that's what we're showing is that 65% across the country and 62% in, in Wisconsin are uh, require, going to require that level of post-secondary education and training. So when we drill down and look at job openings, again, by occupation area in Wisconsin, we see, uh, we see it becomes actually even more interesting because you start to see the education requirements associated with particular occupational fields and areas. You get a much better sense of this. So what you'll see, and just this shows the share of job openings within that occupational area that require some college associate degree, BA or beyond. And it's the red and the green that is, is post-secondary education and training. It's the blue that's uh, high school or less than high school, which is a diminishing portion, the less than high school for sure, over the last 30 or 40 years. And what you see is in most of the occupational areas, nearly every job opening is going to is going to go to a worker with post-secondary education and training. So in STEM, it's almost 100 percent. It's actually 95 percent, but it's a large number. In education services, as you can expect, uh, a, lot, a lot of job openings are going to go to those, especially with BAs and beyond. And then when you get into management and professional office occupations, that's very high, too. That's nearly 90 percent. Healthcare professions, um, which are an important area because it's one of the fastest growing occupational areas in Wisconsin and nationwide, includes nurses, doctors, technicians, and others. That obviously, that's going to require uh, nearly three quarters uh, of workers with post-secondary education and training. But I think what's most interesting, a lot of that may be, you're not, you know, see some nodding heads that that makes sense. What's even more interesting, I think, is even in some of what we call the blue collar occupational areas at the very top, e even that is trending towards more workers are having, having associate degrees, technical associate degrees, or uh, some college or certificates or uh, something beyond high school. So those are line production jobs, as well as supervisors of, uh, of production jobs, construction jobs, transportation, uh, transportation and logistics uh, jobs, and, uh, and a whole range of, range of jobs. And it, as you can see, more than half, um, about more than half are going to require, just a little bit over half are going to require some form of post-secondary education and training. Now, we've uh, recently been doing some research on what we call good jobs, what we've defined as good jobs uh, that are available, particularly to those without a bachelor's degree, so those, uh, those that, that don't actually have a four-year degree. But we, we've applied this analysis across the board. And, and our, our analysis of good jobs is based on a wage threshold for individual wages. So we set a lower one for younger workers, 35000 per year and then a higher level for older workers because they're later in their career and probably have more tenure, et cetera. So what we find, it turns out, is that the more education you have, the more likely you are to have a good job. So this, it really reinforces a lot of the education trends that I showed in my previous, trend, uh, previous slides. And, and just, just to make a, a bring this, make a, uh, put a fine point on this, so bachelor's degree holders all the way to the right um, are about twice as likely, actually more than twice as likely to have a good job than uh, high school educated workers, which are on the, on the left side there, 69 compared to 31%. So this pattern, this staircase pattern, upward staircase pattern of rising chances of having a good job based on education level is very much is very similar to other patterns we've all seen educators and business people and policymakers it's very similar to what what weekly wages are by wage by by education level annual earnings by by education level as well as lifetime earnings there's a similar staircase pattern so our research a lot of our research in the past and currently has focused on the close connection, the increasingly close connection between what you study and you know, how much you study and what you make and how you do in the labor market. Now let's just turn to the supply side for a moment and you know, what's happening with attainment in Wisconsin. And some of this really builds on Susan's points and, Susan's, and, and the package that's in your, your folder. 
so when it comes to attainment, uh, Wisconsin has uh, roughly, roughly the same share of people. And this looks at people, not the workforce. So that's an important point, too, distinction there. Has roughly the same share of people with bachelor's degree and, and bachelor's degrees and beyond as the nation as a whole. I think what's, what's interesting is in the middle of the education spectrum, I think, where Wisconsin differs from at least the nation, uh, not, so, not so different from other Midwest and Plains states, is a larger concentration of people in the population with, with an associate's degree in particular. And so there's a slightly larger concentration in that area. Somewhat similar levels give you a point or two uh, separate you from the rest of the nation as far as high school level and some college. So it's barely much. But the real difference is at that associate level, which I think partly reflects the mix of jobs across the state and in, in the Midwest and the Plains states as well. And one thing I want to point out, this is somewhat different from the chart that you'll see in the Stronger Nation report in one key way, and that is the Lumina Foundation has started to show certificate attainment, right, as a separate marker. And so they, they've started to measure, and so you'll see a percentage for certificate attainment in the report. They've started to measure what is considered a high quality certificate that leads to employment that's necessary for a job, or that leads to further education. And actually, that is, uh, in some ways, very um, appropriate in Wisconsin, given a lot of your work on embedded credentials, embedded program, embedding certificates into degree programs, and a lot of that work. It has, that idea has less meaning in some other states that have, have not spent as much time on that. Now, as you know, as Susan quickly indicated, attainment varies across the state. This is not unique to Wisconsin. As we've seen this in every state we've gone to. And what you see is definitely higher attainment levels in uh, Dane County, southeastern Wisconsin, uh, and areas closer to Chicago, and then up to, through Green Bay, and then also in western, uh, the western portions as well. So, the main generalization here, which is true everywhere, I think, I, I think I can say that, is that metro areas and surrounding communities, the areas that surround metro areas, generally have higher attainment levels, uh, given the job base and the population base, than rural areas and less populated areas. There are also gaps by race ethnicity. There, there are pretty wide gaps in Wisconsin and other states uh, between the attainment levels that whites and Asian students or workers have generally, and uh, blacks and Latino, black and Latino students on the other hand. So when we think about attainment and trying to affect attainment in a state, or nationally for that matter, but it's probably more appropriate to think about it at a state level, uh, or more actionable, I guess you could say, there are really three levers or three indicators that we look for. I mean, there are many indicators, many possible indicators, but there are three really important gauges. And the, and the first one is high school graduation, right? Because that high school graduation sets you up for, uh, for post-secondary education in particular, right? Uh, wherever that might be, technical college, university college, private college, uh, public college. Also, college enrollment, are people actually making that transition into into a college, into a post-secondary institution, and then college completion. Are you getting across the finish line wherever you start, essentially? So those are the three areas. There are other measures, obviously, progress within, right, progress within college coursework and other things that, we could, that you can talk about. But those are the three that I'm going to quickly cover. So the first one is graduation, high school graduation. Uh, Wisconsin, like a lot of the states in the Midwest and the Northeast in particular, uh, is expected to have a decline in the number of high school graduates in the next decade or so. These numbers are based on the witchy knocking on the college door projections that they do every two or three years, I think. This is their most recent set. And so essentially the lines show the number of high school graduates across the state in relation to the starting point, which is 2010. So if the, if the line is going down or it's below the, the axis there, the uh, the horizontal line, it means that it's a lower number than where you started. So, and as you can see, it's, it somewhat tracks the US 
total, but it's a little bit below. So, so that's, that's the, uh, the whisk. so you're going to see a drop off. That's according to the Witchy projections, a drop off in high school graduates that are going to be available for post-secondary education, for the workforce, et cetera. And this trend, as I said, is, is not, uh, not just in Wisconsin, but other states as well. So most high school graduates across the country and in Wisconsin do go on to some form of post-secondary education training, something beyond education, something beyond high school, either right away or within a few years after high school. And there are differential rates of college transi transition. One of the major factors is higher income students have a much higher transition rate than lower income students. So actually, they're set. Their, their college transition rates are separated by something like 20 points or so. Um, quite a bit less likely, lower income students are much less likely to make that, make that leap into, into college. So what this chart shows, I think, is interesting, is who's showing up as first-time students, as essentially freshmen, so to speak, freshmen, fresh women, uh, on campuses in Wisconsin. And, and it looks at 2005 and then 2015. And what you see is a real shift, right? Both at the four-year level and the two-year institutional level, we're seeing that Latino students are making up a much larger share of the incoming new college students. Uh, white students are making up a somewhat smaller share. That's the larger blue bar. So what we're seeing, and you're probably seeing that on many of your campuses, it's, the difference is actually, it's, it's interesting, it's happening both at the four-year and the two-year. In some states, it's a little bit, it, it's, it's, uh, it's tilted one towards one sector or the other. But what we're seeing is the college population is changing, right? We're seeing, and that's true across the country. And I think that what, what that means is that as we see more historically underrepresented students entering college, we're going to be seeing more first-generation students, those whose parents haven't, haven't made their way into college. And I think that has implications for advising, orientation to college, uh, helping people get through college, especially those that haven't, uh, whose parents may not have been there to, uh, to open the door or show the way. So the next indicator, the third indicator, is completions or award production. And this chart shows degrees and certificates conferred across the state, what you'll see going back to 2011. So it's kind of a year-by-year -year trend of what's happening. It's just based on the IPEDS national data set. Uh, you actually probably have a lot better data coming out of your administrative set data sets at the technical colleges and University of Wisconsin system. But, um, and, and the private colleges probably as well also have good administrative data as well. But this is the IPEDS data. And what you see is bachelor's degree production has been going up somewhat since 2011, maybe a little bit of a hiccup somewhere around 2014, 2015. But bachelors have been going up. Associate degrees went up coming out of the recession. You know, there was a, here in other, in other states, there was a large enrollment uh, influx uh, during the recession, coming out of the recession. But there's been a fall off since 2012, in somewhat noticeable fall off since 2012. And certificates have been mostly flat. Again, certificate production in most states and here went up coming you know, during the recession, coming out of the recession, and has tapered off somewhat. And uh, so I think completions, you know, why track this? Why look at this? Well, I think completions are an important indicator of kind of where you've been. And, and it's also, it's a sign of your momentum towards increased attainment ultimately, right? Because I think it's especially important for looking at what's going on with younger students, those ages 25 to 34, who are perhaps just uh, beyond the traditional college going age range. Because what's happening with completions, especially in that younger cohort, is really a sign of where your attainment is headed in the future. It's really the future it's the future image of the state's attainment rate. So as Susan said, we've been to a number of states together. I've been to a number of states either on my own or with other folks from HCM and Georgetown. And, and so we've seen that there, there, are now, uh, there are now 40 or so states, actually more than 40 states, that have set an attainment goal, generally pretty ambitious and uh, kind of a stretch goal. 
And I think what we've seen at Georgetown, and, and uh, um, um, let Susan speak for herself, but, uh, but certainly what we've seen at Georgetown is that having a goal can, is an important tool. It's an important, it's an important strategy for bringing people together, especially across different, state, uh, different sectors, uh, different stakeholders across the state. It's really, it's a way to focus, bring focus to often disparate strategies. So it can pull together what's going on in K through 12, uh, what reform strategies in K through 12 with what's going on in technical colleges, universities, as well as workforce agencies who are focused on getting people into jobs or in between jobs and economic developers as well who are interested in the, the economic implications of, at of increased attainment and what that means. I think completion, as opposed compared to attainment, is, is a, has become a very important focus for post-secondary reform efforts. And so it's, it's very important to college leaders who, uh, who are interested in improving the success rate of those students who are already inside, who have already made it into the college, essentially, and are, and, and, and are interested in trying to make sure they get to the finish line as, as soon as they can or as well as they can. Attainment, I think, is equally significant. It's just a little bit more abstract than completion. Completion, you can get your hands on and you can see it. Attainment is a little bit more abstract, but it's no less significant because it brings a focus not only to students who are already inside, who are already have made it into the college pipeline, whether it's two-year or four-year or private college, but also students who might be outside the pipeline. This would include adults who are already in the workforce who may have a high school diploma but, but nothing more and could benefit, could have in better wages by going back to college or s taking some, some uh, post-secondary course. It also includes young people who may not have made the transition from high school to college. So, so I think attainment provides a healthy focus on not just those in, inside the pipeline but those who are outside who may not have even considered college in the first place. And I think attainment is also meaningful to a wide range of stakeholders. It's obviously interested to, in, interesting to educators, college leaders, who that's their life, their business, but also to business people, business and industry, and policymakers as well, who see its ultimate importance to the state. So as I said, most states, 40 and counting, have already set an attainment goal. And it's for a good reason, and that is that students are going to need some level of post-secondary education and training to thrive in the economy they're facing today and in the future. Thank you very much.